a lot of things you already know. Um, some of these things need, need to be restated, don't they, I believe? And uh, we've been on um, a couple of marches now. In fact, I think Lynn's been on three marches up in London, the Freedom Marches. The last one uh, we went on the other Saturday, um, there was probably upwards of uh, two million people there. Nothing on the news, nothing in the newspaper, hardly anything. Um, uh, GB News uh, had it on the next day. And um, it's amazing, isn't it, that, uh, I mean, uh, hundreds of thousands of people out, outside number 10 Downing Street, nothing in the newspaper, nothing on the news, very strange. People were throwing tennis balls over with uh, various people's names that had died and messages and uh, things were written on these, on these tennis balls. And um, uh, it was very interesting that uh, we met, uh, we were late actually, and the march had already gone. You think, well, you couldn't miss two million people, would you? But we did. <laughs> And then, and then we heard, well, they were going to Oxford Street, so we jumped back on the tube because they were they started off at Hyde Park. And um, so there was a lady with her daughter from Essex, and uh, you could tell that uh, she was part of the march because she didn't have a mask on. And uh, she said, well, have you missed the march? She said, yeah, we, we think they're going to Oxford Street. So she came with us. And she was sharing with me while we were waiting uh, for the train to come along. Um, that things were moving so quickly, she said, and she thought she had more time than what she had. Now, I'm talking to a person who's not a believer. She's not a Christian. Um, but she seemed to know exactly what was going on and, and how long she had. And, and I thought, why, why, aren't, why aren't the church more awake as to what's happening here? And um, then we were on the march and we had these signs uh, we were holding up. And... Uh, and a lady came up to us and uh, well, came up to Georgina and Lynn, actually, and uh, she was um, called Tamara. And uh, she uh, said that she was uh, uh, a Messianic Jewess. And I said, well, where do you go to church? And she said, well, I don't go to church. She said, the, the church seemed to be asleep. They don't seem to see what's happening. I, I stopped going. And she was so pleased to see us. And she asked if she could pray for Georgina. And she was so excited. And to hear about the camp weekend we were having, um, I don't know if she's going to come, but might put her on the uh, email list. And have you heard back from her at all? No. Um, so she might pitch up. Who knows? Um, but I, I see, I see it as a huge mission field. I, I see these, you know, the, these freedom marches. They're not all anti-vaxxers by any means, but they, they're certainly anti-lockdown. That's for sure. And. Uh, they, they seem to know all about the end times, but they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't know um, it's in the book of Revelation. They have no understanding of it whatsoever. When this lady from Essex was sharing with me on the, uh, the platform, I spun the, uh, the sign round, which says, Bible warning, Revelation 13, first mark, next, first mask, next mark. And she said, is that in the Bible? I've never read that. And I said, well, it is, my love. It's all in the scripture. And I see that as a huge mission field for the church in the end times, that we need to get the gospel out to these folk. And the church needs to wake up as well. You know, there needs to be an awakening. Um, they need to come out of their, their, their comatose, their, their apathy, if you like. Um, I, I want to read, uh, start with uh, reading something out of Isaiah 61. This is obviously prophetic. Uh, Jesus was coming uh, uh, to the world. And uh, it, it was proclaimed, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives in the opening of prison, to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Hallelujah. Amen. So let me say this to you tonight. If you're not at liberty, if you are broken hearted, you are not at liberty if you are still held captive to something to anything. You are not at liberty if you are still imprisoned because you are bound by the past. You are not at liberty if, you still, if you're still in mourning after a year uh, and that spirit of grief has now entered you. 
and you haven't received the oil of joy. You are not at liberty if you are under a spirit of heaviness and have not embraced the garment of praise. You see, are we there yet, folks? Do we know the fullness of God? Are we living in the fullness of God? Do we understand it? Have we just dipped our toe in or is there more? I believe there's much more, folks, that we need to embrace. You know, God takes our liberty very seriously. Uh, so much so he included in the law of Moses uh, for the Hebrew slaves. You could, uh, in, you'll find this in Exodus 21, 2 to 4, Deuteronomy 15, 12, Leviticus 25, 23 to 46. The Hebrew slave could work for six years, but on the seventh year, he must be freed. And then, of course, you've got the year of Jubilee, literally means ram horn. Jubilee means ram horn, ram's horn. It defi it's defined in Le Leviticus 25, 9, seven times seven years, 49. On the, on the 50th year, the, the, the slave, all the slaves had to be free. The year of Jubilee was released from all indebtedness, all types of bondage, Prisoners, captives set free, all slaves were released, all property returned to its original owners, all labor ceased for one year, and the land and the people rested. And it started with the shofar being blown. Isn't that amazing? And yet, you see, the children of Israel weren't listening to the commands of God. Let me read this out to you from uh, Jeremiah 34, 8, 17. And this was due to the treacherous treatment of slaves. God had had enough. So he, he, he commanded that they set them free. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people who were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty to them. That every man should set free his male and female slave. A Hebrew man or woman that no one should keep a Jewish brother in bondage. Now when all the princes and all the people who had entered into the covenant heard that everyone should set free his male and female slaves and no one should keep them in bondage anymore, they obeyed and let them go. But afterward, they changed their minds and made the male and female slaves return whom they had set free and brought them into subjection as male and female slaves. Therefore, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt and the house of bondage, saying, At the end of seven years, let every man set free his Hebrew brother who has been sold to him. And when he has served you six years, you shall let him go free from you. But your fathers did not obey me, nor incline their ear. Then you recently turned and did what was right in my sight, every man proclaiming liberty to his neighbor. And you made a covenant before me in the house, which is called my name. Then you turned around and profaned my name. And every one of you brought back his male and female slaves, whom he had set at liberty at their pleasure and brought them back into subjection to be your male and female slaves. Therefore, thus says the Lord, you have not obeyed me in proclaiming liberty. Every one to his brother and every one to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim liberty to you, says the Lord, to the sword, to pestilence and to famine. And I will deliver you to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth. You see, there's a shadow and type here, isn't there? And we need to pick up on that. What's God saying in this? The Lord wants to see, you see, us to see Jesus says, all those who call upon his name, shall be saved or shall be free if you like and those whom he sets free he says are free indeed you know uh, he, he doesn't say he just gives us life but he says he gives us abundant life that's more than life isn't it that's abundance hallelujah but the enemy you see when you enter salvation the enemy is obliged to obey at the time of the new birth there is much rejoicing. People rejoice. The, the weight's gone. I remember uh, a, a stewardess who came to the Lord flying. And when she got home, uh, her flatmate said, there's something different about you. And she said, yes. Yeah. She said, there's, there's a real 
look in your face, a brightness in your face. You've fallen in love, haven't you? She said, yes, I have. You've met a man, haven't you? She said, yes, I have. What's his name? She said, Jesus. She said, eh? <laughs> but you see, she'd fallen in love with the Lord. And there is rejoicing. And there is a change. People's countenance changes. The peace, the Prince of Peace comes and indwells you. And you cannot find peace out there in the world. It can only be found in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But the enemy and his cohorts have been trying to recapture the souls set at liberty ever since. And he's still trying to recapture those souls set at liberty. You see, the enemy believes the word of God, but he doesn't believe in the word of God. There's a difference. He quoted it to Jesus. He misquotes it, didn't he? He loves to misquote it, but he knows the word of God. He knows the beginning to the end. No doubt about it. But he doesn't believe in it. You see, he knows it is unlikely he's going to get a Christian to commit a big dramatic sin. Because the Holy Spirit's in that person, convicting them of sin. And so you can't really enter sin without the knowledge of it. The Holy Spirit convicts you. And you know immediately if you're going down the wrong road. So, but you see, he doesn't have to. All he has to do is dial down your temperature. I'll say that again. All he has to do is dial down your temperature to lukewarm. And then he knows that Jesus is going to spew you out of his mouth. And as far as the enemy is concerned, job done. And what's happening is, I believe, the church is losing its fervor. The church is losing its fire. And we need to, we need to get back to where we need to be. Uh, God says in Revelation 3.16, he will vomit them out who are lukewarm. So we have to, you see, flies don't land on a hot plate, folks. If you keep stirred up for God, if you keep on fire for God, the enemy won't mess with you. He'll go and mess with somebody else who's more likely to fall, who's more likely to trip, picks off the, the one who can't keep up with the herd, if you like. We see it in the natural, don't you? All the time with the wildebeest, with the lions picking off the ones who can't keep up. You see, we are called to be faithful until death. Revelations 2 verse 9. Faithful unto death. Not, not until there's a football match. Not faithful until there's a, an international tennis match. Or there's something better to do. It reminds me of the story... Um, in China uh, of a, a, a secret church service and uh, the secret police found out about it and entered and they came up the front and they said all those who aren't committed Christians need to leave this room now and half the church left and then they said now all the people remaining are you committed Christians? And they all thought, of course, they were probably going to be shot. But they said yes. And the secret police said, so are we. We just didn't trust the others. And that's the issue today, isn't it? Who's committed? Who isn't? Who's faithful? Who isn't? Who's lukewarm? Who's on fire for God? And who isn't? Who can we rely on? You know, I, I, I've led other churches and I've had people on the leadership before and, and you know, some people aren't reliable. And it's very stressful when you've, you've got someone saying they'll do something and you're always chasing them up to find out if they've done it. Always chasing them up. It's easier just to do it yourself because you need to be able to trust people that they're going to do what they say they're going to do. But it's very hard to do that. And we must be trustworthy. We must let our yes be yes and our no be no. Very important. You see, the enemy knows that iron sharpens iron. Proverbs 27, 17. He knows that iron sharpens iron. That's why, you see, we sharpen each other in church. But you see, if you're not going, that, why do you think the enemy wants to close all the churches down? Because he doesn't want iron sharpening iron. He doesn't want us sharpening each other up. He wants our swords a dull edge. He wants a dull edge on the Christian sword. He wants us to lose that edge. And it's so important that we meet together. It's so important that we stir the coals 
and let the breath of God breathe upon us and keep us in the meeting. Hallelujah. So how do we keep that fervor going? How do we keep, well, we have to keep in the word of God. We have to keep in the presence of God. We have to walk in the spirit of God to keep that fire burning. You know, I meet more unchurched Christians now than ever before. A, a, a lot of unchurched Christians are out there. They're disillusioned with the church or they've been hurt with the church. And they, they, but the thing is, you see, we're going to need each other in the times ahead. You know, there are no lone rangers out there. The enemy will pick them off. We need the body. It's the body that has the power. One can put a thousand to flight, two ten thousand. So how many more can 50 put to flight or a hundred or a thousand? We need each other, folks, in the times ahead and the days ahead. Let me tell you, these freedom marchers know that. They're talking about communities. They're talking about helping each other out. They're talking about not being able to buy or sell. They're talking about all kinds of things. They've, they've got more of their act together than the church has. You see, the spirit of apathy is hot on the heels of lukewarmness. And it does bother me. It does bother me. It is often said that evangelism is caught, not taught. Which is the opposite to COVID, if you get my meaning. How determined are we to see our friends and family saved? We have to ask ourselves that. Persecution is coming. And I want to say tonight, if you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Interesting thought, isn't it? What if they interviewed your colleagues at work? They might say, well, he or she takes the perks we all take that go with the job. They use the company's telephone, but they don't pay for their calls. They take extra time on their lunch hour. They don't put the correct mileage down. They take allowances they're not entitled to. The perks of the job, we all do it. Or maybe they might interview your children. And your children might say, well, my parents never practice what they preach. It's always do as I say, but not as I do. Or maybe they'll interview your friends socially. Maybe they'll say, well, he enjoys a few pints or she enjoys a few drinks, as we all do. They laugh at dirty jokes like we all do. Even now and again, they slip up and I hear the odd four-letter word come out. You see, we need to be sure that the evidence is there. Hallelujah. It's very important. It's time to dial up the temperature in the body of Christ in the UK. You know, the Lord sets us free from our sin in regards to salvation, but not always the consequences of our sin. Sometimes we have to live with that e.g. adultery, the consequence might be divorce. That divorce might lead you to Christ. But we have to live, maybe, with the consequence of that adultery because our wife doesn't, or husband doesn't want to come back to us. What about drugs with brain damage or alcohol abuse with uh, liver disease? These things can only be healed in the grace of God. Sometimes he does heal the consequence of our sin. I've seen him do that. But other times we have to live with it. You see, the paralytic who was lowered through the roof by his friends. I find an interesting case. You'll find this in Matthew 9, verses 1 to 6. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Then, behold, 
They brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed when Jesus saw their faith. Now, Jesus saw not the paralytic's faith. He saw the faith of his friends. Important for us to pick up on this. It's not just your faith, but if, if you have the faith for one of your friends or your family members to be saved, to be healed, Jesus will accept that faith. And he looked on their faith. He said to the paralytic son, uh, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes, but Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easy to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power to men. You see, he'd already forgiven the paralytic sin. The paralytic was still laying on his bed. And there's a lot of Christians like that. They've come to the Lord, they've, they've been forgiven their sin, but they're not actually doing anything for God. They haven't embraced what the cross means. And it wasn't until he actually got up and embraced his healing and picked up his bed and walked, did that kick in. So he wouldn't have known he would have been healed because he was a paralytic. So while he's lying on his bed, he couldn't possibly have known if his legs were going to work until he attempted to stand on them. Amen. And this is so important for so many Christians that we, we move out in faith, we step out. I mean, it, it might well be through your, I mean, my own sister prayed me into the kingdom. I was the rebel of the family. I was the black sheep. People used to say, Nigel, he'll never get saved. My goodness me. Adrian, my twin brother's more likely to get saved than me because I was a hell raiser. But those who sin a lot, love a lot, let me tell you. And God's always on their case. And uh, my sister prayed me into the kingdom. And here I am, hallelujah, some 40 years later. But our God is a gracious God. And I, I had to go through things, you know, justification. We cross the line at a Billy Graham crusade and we, we call on the name of the Lord. That, that's, uh, that's justification, just as if you've never sinned. If you died on the spot, you'd be going to glory. But sanctification is both a standing and a process. And sometimes those doors we've opened in our lives, we've got to go back and close. And the Lord had me close a few doors, let me tell you. And it was very painful, some of the doors I had to close. It was, you know, very awkward. It was embarrassing, but he wasn't letting me off the hook. I had to go back and close them. I had to deal with them. And as I dealt with them and began to unpick the ball of string I made in my life, the string got straighter and straighter and straighter. And the peace of God was more and more apparent in my life. And so when I end up counselling people, I, I come from a place of experience, you know. I say, where you're sitting in the hot seat, I've sat there. I've had to have men of God lay hands on me and deal with bondage in my life. And I know the fruit of it. I know how it can change you. And so I say to them, you know, even, even talking about the, just a little thing like the perks of the job. New, daily newspapers used to come on the aeroplane, big stack of them. And uh, all the, all the uh, covers were there. And everybody, all the crew would take their favourite newspaper and put it in their bag to read in the hotel and then dish it out to the, to the, to the punters. But uh, the Holy Spirit convicted me of that very soon after I got saved. They said, but Nigel, that's not your newspaper. That's meant for the passengers. It's not meant for you. That's, that's stealing. I thought, what? Of course it's not. But I realised it was. And so from that day on, I only ever took a news newspaper out of the back of the chair that a pa passenger had already read and took that off the aeroplane. Some of the crew thought that was ridiculous or crazy, but to me, it was important, you see. Uh, there, were, there were other perks of the job, if you like, that the Lord spoke to me about personally and said, no, you, you can't do that now. You've got to change. And so gradually, you see, uh, charity begins at home. We have to sort ourselves out before we can sort anyone else out. And it's line upon line, precept upon precept. And gradually, 
God changes you from the inside out. And, uh, and so people say to me often, well, is so-and-so a sin? Now, if somebody says to you, is theft a sin? You say, well, of course it is. Is adultery a sin? Well, of course it is. Well, what about using bad language? Of course it is. But uh, what about collecting Beano comics? Well, I said, well, there's, there's an interesting question because in and of itself, collecting Beano comics isn't a sin. But if it's so important to you that it dethrones the Lord in your life and takes up so much of your time that you're not able to read the scriptures and spend time with God, then it is a sin. So there are some things, you see, that uh, are sin uh, to one person but not to another. And it, it all depends on how much of your life that thing has. I mean, some people get just so excited about football, it is their God. I mean, they, they just eat, sleep and breathe football. And, if, and these guys don't play themselves. Some of them are so overweight, but their team is everything to them. And if their team loses, it puts them into manic depression for days. You know? I mean, a friend of mine used to play cricket. And if he lost a game, he would be depressed for two or three days. I mean, it, it was amazing. And I thought, this, this has far too much of a hold on you. And so we as Christians have to hold everything lightly, don't we? And we have to say, Lord, is this a bondage in my life? Uh, because if it is, Lord, whatever it is, I want it gone. And it, and it, and it might be a, a bondage to you, but it's not a bondage to somebody else. But it's as the Lord convicts you. So you have to act upon it. And so the consequence of our sin in God's grace and mercy sometimes restores and heals. But Jesus also spoke to another man, didn't he? And he was the man at the pool of Bethsaida. And he was waiting for the, uh, the, uh, the uh, pool to stir, but... Uh, he could never get in there. And Jesus said to him, well, what do you want? Do you want to be made well? You find this in John 5. And he said, yes. Now, he didn't say your sins are forgiven you. He said, rise, take up your bed and walk. Now, this guy could never get to the pond, never get to the pool. By the time he got there, the water stopped stirring. But he said, rise, take up your bed and walk. Later on, Jesus finds him in the temple. Now, did he say to him, sin no more unless your infirmity returns? No, he didn't. What he said was, sin no more unless something worse befalls you. Unless something worse comes upon you. You see, once you've met with God, once you know truth, once you've experienced truth and you go back to your old life, you go back to Egypt, or as the Bible says, as a dog returns to his vomit, the consequence of your sin is increased. And Christians don't realise this. And in fact, it's the, uh, there's a scripture which talks about the... Uh, the, 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 uh, the sin of the backslider reproves him and brings him back to the Lord. Why? Because the Lord, out of his love for us, turns up the heat. Amen? And we don't get away with it. I want to read a, a, a few scriptures in, clothing, in closing that... Um, that we need to take to our heart. Galatians 5.1 Stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Romans 8.2 For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Colossians 2.13 to 14, 
and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Hallelujah. Hebrews 4, 9 to 10. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from, he, from his. You enter jubilee. Do you see that? Salvation, when you receive Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you enter his rest. You enter jubilee, hallelujah. So what are the signs? We need to check ourselves out. What are the signs of a red-hot Christian? I said, Lord, what are the signs of a red-hot Christian? And the Lord gave me these this afternoon. One, somebody who reads the Bible regularly. Two, someone who spends time in prayer regularly. Three, someone who has an expectancy of divine appointments on a daily basis. So they're looking for the woman at the well. Do you get my drift? They're looking for someone the Lord has for you to speak to. Four, someone who's always ready to give a reason for the hope that is in them. 1 Peter 3, 15. And number five, gives and doesn't count the cost, whether that be of their time or their finances. Hallelujah. Shall we pray? Father, we just thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that, Father, you're... Uh, your word is life, your word is truth, O oh God. We pray, Father, that it will be the plumb line that we will guide our lives by, Father. That, Father, we will take our own temperatures, that we will get a spiritual thermometer and realize, Father, that if we need stirring up in the spirit, Lord, have we allowed apathy to enter our lives, Lord? Is our, is our sword edge dulled, O oh God, and not as sharp as it should be. Father, we want to be on fire for the days ahead, Lord. Would you breathe upon us, breath of God? Father, you will not quench a smoking flax, nor a bruised reed will you break, O oh God. We come before you tonight and ask that you invigor us afresh. Father, we thank you for that time of worship, for your awesome presence, Lord. We thank you we can just lift our voices and worship you. We don't need instruments to worship you. We can just lift our voices and worship you. And we thank you for your presence here, Lord. And I want to say for anyone who's listening online, and I want to say for anyone here who hasn't even embarked upon the journey, hasn't begun the walk because they, they're not born again. They haven't entered Jubilee that they might come to Christ, repent of their sin and come into his rest in Jesus' name. If there's one soul here who wants to make that confession tonight, raise your hand so I can see it. I'll pray for you. If there's one soul online, you need to confess Christ as your Lord and Saviour. Repent of your sin. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Hallelujah. You shall be set free. Those chains shall be broken in Jesus' name. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for a touch on our lives, a touch on our bodies, O oh God. We look to you, Father, for your word, which is health to our flesh and strength to our bones. Fill us afresh, Lord. May the winnowing wind of God come upon us, Lord. Take away the dross in our lives. We don't want to spend time on wood, hay and stubble, Lord. But Father, we want to be, Lord God, 
investing in the kingdom in these days which lie ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.